the wonderful thing about earthquakes is we can use them to help us forecast volcanic eruptions. The not so wonderful thing about earthquakes is they have a mind of their own and sometimes can cause trouble on their own as well. And you guys here happen to be in a place where there's plenty of earthquakes, right? And you probably noticed that. Um, and particularly on October 14th, we had a magnitude 5 earthquake. It's the yellow guy right there. But this is just two weeks of earthquakes in the Pahala area. So Pahala is like right in there. That's where we are right now. The blue ones, though, are much, much deeper than the yellow ones. The blue ones are the ones that have been persistent for the last few years beneath Pahala. Most of them are less than magnitude 3, and most are less than magnitude 2. But the one that caused you problems two weeks ago is different. It's in this yellow colors, which are somewhere between about 5 and 15 kilometers, which is somewhere on the order of three miles to about 10 miles beneath you. So they're shallower earthquakes. So that means the source of the earthquake, and an earthquake is really just generated when some rock slips or breaks in the earth, and when it does that, it moves, and it creates a vibration that goes through the earth. Um, and it varies, right? So we get little earthquakes, and we get big earthquakes. These guys right in here are related to movement at the base of the volcano. That's the same group of earthquakes right there, plotted on Google Earth. So the other thing that we're doing right here is here's the summit of Kilauea right here, the summit of Mauna Loa, and the summit of Luigi. And right in between them, in this area right in here, is where the hot spot is coming up from deep inside the Earth. And those are down at depths that are somewhere around 20 to 40 miles deep. So they're quite deep, and they're in another layer. They're not in the outer crust of the Earth. They're down in what we call the, the mantle. So we have lots of little ones, and then we have some big ones. But what you have to remember is the total energy released by an earthquake. We have that nice magnitude scale that I think everybody knows because it's the numbers from 1 to 10. It's the difference between a magnitude 4 and a magnitude 5, you probably noticed. You've had quite a few 4s here recently, and you had a 5, and it was really different. There's 33 times as much energy released in a magnitude 5 than there is in a 4. It's not just one unit bigger. And to go between 2, so if you went from 4 to 6, it's a thousand times. So there's a thousand times, it's like the, a 6 is like having a thousand 4s all at once. So it, there's a lot more energy released on that magnitude scale than it looks like. And the white things are faults. So these are mapped faults on the island of Hawaii. You'll notice that you live right inside the biggest nest of faults on the island of Hawaii. And notice that nobody else has it. It is uh, it's an interesting thing. And the reason for that is that our volcanoes are very big, right? They're much bigger than they look like. Kilauea, which just doesn't look like much on the ground, is really over, it's about 22,000 feet high from the seafloor. And Mauna Loa is pushing the, uh, close to 30,000 feet from the seafloor. So just the weight of these volcanoes causes them to want to slide outward. They can't slide to the north because the other volcanoes are there, the rest of the island. So they can't push that. So what they're doing is these sides of the volcanoes are moving seaward. Kilauea moves just about that way, and Mauna Loa moves this direction, like this. And so the magma inside and the weight of the volcano cause it to move. Well, it's not perfectly smooth, it binds, so it moves and jumps and starts and fits, right? And those are the earthquakes. Each time it takes a movement like that, it kind of jerks. And depending on how much it moves, it's related to how big the earthquake is. So the magnitude 5 earthquake we had was this moving. That builds up along with the weight of it, and it slides on that seafloor but it gets stuck and then slides forward and gets stuck. And there was a magnitude 4.6 foreshock to that, 24 seconds before the magnitude 5, right? We didn't know it was a foreshock until the magnitude 5 showed up, by the way. So that's the way earthquake stuff works. We don't know until afterwards what to tell you. But the fact that you have two earthquakes right together in close to the same location caused the shaking to last a lot longer. And that causes a lot more stuff to happen, right? So think of a book on a bookshelf. You shake the bookshelf a little bit, and the book maybe moves out an inch. 
But you keep shaking it, you shake it for 10 seconds, it moves out a little further, you shake it for 20 seconds, it moves further, you know, and eventually it'll fall off the bookshelf. So here is the, here are the earthquakes that have taken place. Mahalo is right up in here. And this is the, the area beneath which the, the earthquake actually released. And so there's been about 240 earthquakes from today back to October 14th. Okay, and most of these are what we would classify as aftershocks. And down here is the number. So on October 14th, I think there were around 80 or something in the day. And then they've tapered off, but they're still there. So they decay what we call exponentially. They decay very rapidly in there. So a small earthquake, most of those go away. But after a big earthquake, like a magnitude 7, the aftershocks can be 5s and 6s. And if you've damaged the building already, then those little earthquakes can actually make the building quite dangerous. Here is what people reported. And in here, the blues are less than this. This is Pahala right here. This is the where the earthquake was right here. These are you guys reporting in. So I think some of you guys noticed this. There's another scale besides the magnitude scale that's called the Mercalli scale. And we report this on our reports after every earthquake. And it's color-coded down here. And so it goes through the same numbers, but in Roman numerals. You can see that the colors down in here below 5 are really not going to cause much damage. Above 5, you start seeing damage, and really at 7 up in here is where you start damaging. 7 and 8 start damaging well-built buildings, too. And 9s and 10s will create a lot of damage. So we were in this area, 6 to low 7, right? And so here in Pahala, you had some damage that was relatively significant, right? People really noticed it, and it, it caused problems, right? Um, it wasn't enough that it, you know, took you completely offline or anything like that, but it, it still, there was enough damage with these things to cause problems. One of the lines in here when these shake maps come out in here is it has a thing that it says percent of G, or the force of one, gra one, um, one unit of gravity, right? So one G is what holds us to the earth. So when you're held to the earth, that's the force that you're feeling that's holding you down. So if, what happens if I apply a 1G force in the other direction? Yeah, you're going to be weightless, basically. If I do it gently, if I do it really fast, you might bounce, right? So you don't want to be in an earthquake that's applying a 1G force the other direction, okay? But the, what you experienced in here was about somewhere between 10 and 20% of a G. So that's enough to really shake things, right? That, that kind of force. It's telling you there's a lot of acceleration, and then each time the wave goes, you're accelerating this way, and then you're accelerating that way, and accelerating this way, and that way, right? So think of your house as a person in the back of a pickup truck that accelerates down the street, hits the brakes, reverses, goes the other direction, hits the brakes, goes the other direction, you know, and goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, right? It's not a pleasant ride for your house, right? So these are the kind of things, why these things cause damage and why you want to have well-built buildings. We also have these little triangles all over the island, which are accelerometers, which measure that acceleration of the force of gravity. And if you notice, that triangle right in Pahala is lit up in that kind of yellow-gold color, so it, that's where we know it was in that 10 to 20% G range. Um, so we can actually measure how hard the ground shook in different places. The other thing that happens around here is you have soil. You're very lucky you have soil because you can plant things and they grow and stuff like that, but you're also very unlucky that you have soil because soil acts kind of like jello in an earthquake. So any place where there's deep soils, it shakes a lot and the vibrations continue after the actual earthquake shaking stops. So think of a bowl full of jello. I shake the bowl, I quit shaking the bowl, Bowl isn't moving, but the jello still is, right? And that's what soil does. So having something built on soil makes it more problematic unless you've anchored the foundation all the way down to rock, right? If you're anchored to the rock, then you won't shake with the soil. But if you're just sitting on the soil, you'll shake more. You've probably heard some people, here's the, the, the figure that Frank had. And so there's the October 14th earthquake, and we noticed that, you know, the earthquakes beneath the summit of Mauna Loa tapered down, and it appears to be also some of the, the inflation is kind of tapered off in that. 
But we do know that some Mauna Loa eruptions are preceded by big earthquakes, like magnitude 6 earthquakes. 1984 was the 6.6 .6 earthquake on the Kawiki fault zone up by volcano. So you would have felt that very strongly here too, because that's on one of those faults that comes straight down to the hollow pretty much. Um, but not every eruption is preceded by an earthquake, and not every earthquake is related to an eruption. So this earthquake actually seems to, it was further away from the summit, it may have opened up a little space deep within the volcano, it seems to have relieved a little bit of the pressure in the volcano. So we can't tell you when an earthquake is going to be something that precedes an eruption, but if we saw a magnitude 6 plus earthquake either over someplace from Pahala up to Kapapala Ranch and a little bit north by Volcano, or over in the Kialakakua, Kialakakua area, those are the two areas where we've had magnitude 6 plus earthquakes preceding eruptions before. And so those would make us again wary that this is magnitude 5 and greater historical earthquakes on Mauna Loa. Guess where you guys are? <laughs> You're kind of in the nest of earthquakes, then the nest of the faults, so not a really big surprise there, right? And these are magnitude 6 and greater, and we're not going to talk about it now, but in 1868 there was a pretty big earthquake over here. And it was a, probably a magnitude 8 earthquake. And it was preceded by a pair of magnitude 7 earthquakes, and probably a week's worth of magnitude 5s and 6s. So it was really quite a thing, and the entire south end of the island from here all the way over to here moved, and we think that places on here moved many tens of feet at the coastline, right? And there was a 50-foot local tsunami generated at Woodington State Beach Park, landslides up in Wood Valley that killed people, overran a village, right? So we have the potential to generate really large earthquakes and damaging earthquakes. So it's something to be aware of and just be prepared of. And if that, so the next thing is these peculiar earthquakes that started in 2019 that sit beneath Mahala and a little bit over to the east of us here. And so we actually have a, a scientist, Ninfa Bennington, who's working with another scientist from UH Manoa. And they put out a whole bunch of extra seismometers. So you saw from um, what Frank showed you, our normal instrumentation on Mauna Loa. Well, those are all seismometers down through here, and a whole bunch of other seismometers in orange. And they're trying to image these earthquakes that are sitting under Mahalo. So they ran this experiment back in the summertime, so I think June and July. Um, and they just picked up those. So if anybody was involved in that, we thank you very much for your participation in allowing these guys to come onto your land. And we have this set of earthquakes. So here they are. These are these things that are deeper than 20 miles deep in the earth, right? And they form kind of a big flat zone. And we think they're related somehow to the hot spot. And where you have kind of the gooey, kind of silly putty-like part of the interior of the Earth rubbing against the harder, kind of crusty shell of the Earth in there. So there's something going on, and typically these earthquakes have been small. This is just showing how they built up, that in uh, 2013, you know, there you got a couple months, nothing going on. Same time period in 2015, a few more show up. And then 2019, they really get going, and then this is this year's bunch of earthquakes in here. So we've had earthquakes like this before, but they kind of were up more towards the summit of Kilauea, but at around the same depth, so this isn't just the only case of these. Most of these have been less than magnitude 4, and most of them have been less than magnitude 3 and 2. Most of them are quite small. But you probably noticed that you've felt a few more lately. And so these magnitude 4 earthquakes, this is the magnitude 4 earthquakes, and this is just a depth, and this is just a time over in here. So this is starting in August of 2020, August of 2021, and August of 2022. So you can see we're getting more of these magnitude 4 earthquakes. They're all kind of centered over here, a little bit to the east of where we are. We don't know if these are going to get any bigger or not. Um, we don't really understand them very well, quite frankly. I mean, they appear to be 
We're right in the middle, right where the hot spot is coming up, and something's going on down there. But there's been other people that have said, oh, there's going to be a giant volcano that erupts here, or something's going to happen, you know, something terrible. We have no indication of that. Um, they appear to be a flurry of these things. The mantle is moving down at that depth and adjusting. Uh, but what it's doing, we don't really know, and we hope to find out more about it. We don't think they're going to get up. They're, they're not, let's just say this, in order to have a really big earthquake, you have to move a big area, right? And you saw to get the magnitude 8 earthquake, we had to move the whole south half of the island to do that. These are concentrated in a place. I don't think, I mean, it's possible they can get up to 5, but it's, it's hard to believe from the area that they covered that they would get much bigger than that. What you can do is make sure everything that you've got in your house is secured to walls. Um, lots of things you don't think about, like dressers and TVs and stuff like that. Well, the new style TVs are almost all secured to walls, but um, things that kids can pull over on themselves and stuff like that. It's also good to have them secured. And things with glass in them. You don't want your nose dropping on the floor and getting up in the middle of the night and having glass all over your floors. You also want to make sure that if you've got any gas in your house, like for water heaters or stoves, that everything is really secured so you don't break the gas line by having the, the appliance move around. And during an earthquake, it's recommended you drop to the ground uh, on your own before it drops you. And then you try to cover particularly your head and your back if you can from damage from things that might fall down on you. And then try to get near something that you can hold on so you don't get bounced along the floor. And have a good plan, right? And have, so a plan would be what you need for volcanic eruptions too. Have a communications plan, a phone number that your whole family can call. You know, if your phones are out and you get to a phone, have some friend that's not in the affected area that everyone can call into and tell them that they're okay. Uh, have a plan of where you might meet up, right? Have all your materials that you need of your house, you know, anything that you own and stuff, have all your important documents in a little bag someplace that you can pick up and take with you. And also have some food and water, right? Because if this is something big, like a really big earthquake, it'll impact the entire island. And there's a good chance that our ports may not be working, we may not be able to get stuff for a while, right? And so we'll be depending on each other, but we may be on our own for a little bit in a big emergency like that. So it never hurts to have those things prepared. So. Anyway, thank you guys very much, and I'll turn it back to Talmadge.